Welcome to The Winning Mentality, the podcast getting the stories behind sporting success with me, Charlie Bosco. On today's episode, I'm chatting to a man whose achievements include, but aren't limited to, uh, competing in three world championships, six Paralympics and two London marathons. He's taken part in 50 different sports, and even after his sporting career ended, he became chairman of the British Paralympic Association and was also an integral part of the bid that brought the Olympics and Paralympics to London in 2012. Mike Brace was a sports-mad kid, but when he was 10, he picked up a bottle which some other kids had hidden a firework in. The firework exploded and Mike was blinded. His determination ever since to live with passion and to experience everything that life and sport has to offer is incredible and to be honest I felt ashamed at times listening to him when I thought about the excuses I make for opting out of a challenge. Mike talks openly about the aftermath of losing his sight and also gives out some superb nuggets of advice coupled with a few very funny stories. I think you'll enjoy this one. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. Also joined by your guide dog Izzy. Your first guide dog you were telling me you've had about seven and a half years that's right when um when i was working i i thought well, i wouldn't ever get a guide dog didn't need one and then um coming up to retirement i thought well perhaps it might be easier and generally the environment's got a bit worse i think with cars on pavements and uh, overhanging trees and i thought perhaps the dog might be uh, might be better and uh, so it's proved I'm amazed to hear you say that because you lost your sight when you were 10, right? So yeah. you went through your whole working life without a guide dog. Yeah, when when I was growing up, uh, when I first lost my sight and went to uh, the school, the boarding school for, uh, for the blind in uh, Wimbledon, um, the whole ethos really was you've got to be independent, you've got to be independent, you've got to get mobile, you've got to do all these things for yourself. And so... Um, as a youngster, that's what you did. You, you did the sport, you did all sorts of things to improve your mobility. And in those days, no one really under 50 uh, I'd, I'd ever met had, had got a guide dog. And the whole ethos then was, you know, if you had good mobility and were able, you used a stick. And if you were older and perhaps your mobility wasn't as good, you got a dog. Uh, and that stayed with me for years and then you know as you get a busy lifestyle and I was traveling a fair bit with uh, both the sport and uh, and work um, it then meant that you were always having to find reasons um, you know whether you had the dog with you or not have a dog with you you then had to cope with that by you know feeding them and stuff like that and I thought I just can't be can't be bothered so basically it was always a reason not to have a dog rather than them one to get one and then coming up to retirement I thought yeah perhaps it might be easier and quicker and slicker now so just going back to the accident where you lost your sight and you went to the um the school for the blind what was that like you've always reading about you this is the first time i've actually met you in the flesh but doing my research before i came here you seem like such a positive guy did you how did you deal with it at the time i think it was a mixture really i think luckily uh age 10 no one really really told me that i had an option to give up or to be um negative about it um Luckily, my mum was pretty, pretty positive, pretty um, supportive, but in, but in a in a very, um, I say, good way. I mean, she she mothered me, but she didn't smother me, and that was really quite important for allowing me to take the odd risk or, you know, be be independent. And um, I suppose the 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 not anger, but but getting on buses and people talking about you as though you didn't exist or making assumptions about you because you were blind uh, on a whole range of things about you and, you know, what you were capable of. I think that was quite a good spur for me at age 10 to say, how dare you? How dare you make assumptions about my abilities um, based on my disability and and for me that was a a really good spur that that sort of really stood me in good stead for the next 50 or 60 years did it give you a kind of defiance almost 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's probably quite good uh, a good way of explaining you know, explaining it. I just felt um, I'm I'm going to be one that decides how well or badly I do at things. How I'll be the one that decides um, what success criteria is in anything I do, work, sport, uh, leisure, or whatever. Uh, but not other, n not let others just define that for me. And what's the process of figuring out what life's going to look like in your adolescence and your early adulthood? Did you just realise that actually you can live the incredibly full life you've lived, or is it just a slow process that doors big just continually open up one after the other? I think it's probably the latter. I think I think at that stage, I remember you know going through a bad time at fifteen or so, thinking, you know, what does the future hold in store? And I'm, I almost feel um, remember sort of for an instant standing on the tube platform, thinking, you know, if I if I did jump onto a train, would would anyone really miss me? And would that be um, you know would that be uh, that that bigger an issue? Uh, and it was only for a few seconds, but I just remember thinking, you know, I'm 15, you know, will you ever get a girlfriend, will you ever have a job, etc., because you're blind. And and that was a really low point, but it luckily only lasted a few seconds. And, you know, the train came in and I got on it and came home and and then, you know, went on to looking at a career or something I could do at work-wise and then obviously uh, met my wife, etc, etc, etc. So it was, a, a, a you know, that, that minute in time where you can't see a, a positive future and wasn't helped by everyone saying, well, of course, will you ever be able to work? Will you ever get married? Will you ever um, do anything um, other than exist? And that didn't help, obviously, at that, that sort of stage in my life. What were the reactions of well, friends and family and, and, and strangers? It, it was mixed. I mean, there's an old cliche that if you can't see, people think you can't hear as well. And I, I remember vividly getting on the bus with my mum and people would say, oh, poor little so-and-so, you know. And I'd, I'd say to my mum, hey, hello, who are we feeling sorry for today? Who's got on the bus? And, <laughs> and then realised it was me they were talking about. And... And and all of those sorts of things, you know, and daily people would come up, um, you know, when I used to stick, they would come up to me and say, oh, do you, do you not have a blind dog? And I'd say, well, if I had a blind dog, I'd have to have another dog to show it where to go because it wouldn't be much <laughs> use, would it? I said, do you mean a guide dog? And, and again, the sort of disability was foremost in their minds and in in, in what they were saying and, and, and talking about. So, um, yeah, it, it, it really was... Um, and you think you've managed to get to a certain stage in development and understanding and then you would get caught out by, you know, staff at work. Um, you know, I was a manager in a department and then someone would say, well, you know, how do you get to work? Does someone have to bring you and physically, you know, bring you to the office and leave you in and then come and collect you? Not, not realising that, you know, you were mobile enough to get to work and back and, uh, and could do a whole range of uh, things with technology or whatever obviously we're a sporting podcast but just going back to your working life quickly I was interested to read on your website you had about two weeks and a job you didn't like but what did you eventually end up doing well I, 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 I realized I didn't like the job after two weeks I was actually there six years but um, I, I started typing and then thought I'm, I'm actually could do more than this and did a couple of a levels um, rather difficultly over even classes and stuff like that and then suddenly had two a levels and thought well I you know I should do more with my life than what I was doing so I then trained as a social worker um, in the east end of London and then started to to work there in uh, in various boroughs and then ended up as an assistant director for children's services in one of the boroughs uh, on uh, south in West London and at what stage did your sporting career begin? I suppose the sporting career really started from almost as long as I can remember because the, the, you know, playing sport was something I did as a child when I could see and, you know, used to go to school very, very early to 
carry on the football match that you know I was 111 to 96 goals up or something like that and you'd get to school at eight o'clock and, and play 45 minutes before uh, you went into school and then play after school and then having had the accident sport was the crutch that basically I, I lent on really to to look at the adjustment to see how my disability uh, was affecting my sporting ability so it was so crucial of being able to set a goal uh, that only I would know if I achieved or failed at. I, di I didn't want to be a failure in anyone's eyes, especially my own in those early days. And sport gave me a chance to set myself a goal of throwing the shot put X meters or running at, you know, a particular time on the track or whatever. And then I could then set myself a new goal when I'd achieved that, that level. And as it happened then, you know, leaving school, there was a big dearth of, of sport uh, provision um, out, outside the boarding school. So I thought, well, you know, I'll set the sports club up that could then give uh, opportunities for the sort of sports we'd done at school for people around the London area. And, and that then led to being asked to try various different sports in, in, in different areas. So I did some athletics and then we did race walking and, and general running and that led on to thinking about marathons. And then within the middle of all, the, all of that, um, we were invited to go to a ski event in uh, Norway um, and I th must admit, I thought they were completely bonkers. You know, the thought of blind people on skis. I think I'd seen the last day of the Lemming uh, film on, <laughs> on one, you know, where they were plopping off the cliff one by one. And I had visions of these blind people suddenly lining up and gradually dropping off one by one. But we went over there and I really got the bug. I just thought this was fantastic because I, I did cross-country skiing. So it's... Uh, uh, where you're zooming along either with a guide in front or behind or whatever, giving directions. But suddenly after, I don't know, 15, 16 years of being blind, I, you know, had, a, had something I could do where you weren't relying on holding on someone's arm or behind a guide dog or whatever. You could, or using a stick, you could just go out and have that total freedom of movement out in the outdoor which was just marvelous and so we we then really got fanatical about going over and and having a go and training and just as we'd been for the second time they announced that they were going to have the first winter paralympics in 1976 in sweden and would we as cross-country skiers like to trial for uh, the british team uh, to compete and so Two friends and I uh, basically said yes, definitely. Started to train down at Aldershot uh, and got selected for the first winter Paralympic team uh, winter games uh, in 1976. And, and basically that was the beginning of, A, my love for skiing, but then involvement in, in sport, both in co competitive levels, but also then in managing uh, different sports and going on to be involved with the Paralympics. It seems as if um, at the start we touched earlier on your almost defiance. Did you see sport initially as a way to prove to yourself and others what you could do? And then it evolved into enjoyment? I, th I think partly that. I think, I think partly it was, again, th this whole self-awareness, self-fulfilling ambition that you wanted to test out your abilities uh, to the full and certainly um, competitive sport at that level really w was the nth degree on that and then uh, and then after that you were then able to provide those opportunities or show other people that you know this was possible and therefore um, getting other people to try the sport was was pretty fantastic and then through that, starting to challenge people's perceptions of, of you and, and, and of disability generally. I read on your website that you've tried 50 sports. Yeah, that was more a question of, you know, again, really what we've just been touching on. I, I, I wanted to try virtually anything I could try and then be the one to decide that I was absolutely rubbish at them. 
um, <laughs> you know, and most of them I was. I was I was dreadful at, at many of them, but but you know, it was it was my decision that I I wouldn't want to do them again, and I was just amazed that. You know, I, I, I know some of the things I've done have been pretty mad, but I've usually found someone even madder than me to enable it to happen. You know, whether it be a parakeet instructor or uh, someone looking at water skiing across the channel, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a fundraising event or marathon running or um, surfing, scuba diving, you know, glide, piloting a glider. You know, it was just those opportunities were just too great to, to miss out on. And then, um, and then obviously moving on to the next one. It's extraordinary, though, because I think a lot of people in all walks of life, in your position, fully sighted people, you can see how people just find something they're good at and they like to stick to it. People just, they find the sport that suits them and they stick with it. And what's really interesting is your determination to always be a beginner at something and always trying to learn something new it was much more the challenge that 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 basically you know in life you end up having um various opportunities and chances or not and and if you're disabled very often those chances are are quite severely diminished usually by either the attitudes of other people thinking you can't possibly want to do that or can't you know can't actually achieve that or whether it be in employment terms as well that that you know you can't use technology and therefore you can't do x y and z and then you've got to prove them wrong and therefore the challenge um that sport gives or tackling new technology or um just general um uh, environmental issues actually become almost a daily part of life so looking for a new challenge i think is probably uh, almost a sub motto of of my life really is is that you know I, I i don't think i get bored easily but i just always quite like something else around the corner that says have you ever tried to do this and if the answer is no then why not why not have a go at it i think also it's about um redefining your own possibilities i saw a fascinating documentary about the first guy who tried to sea kayak the tasman sea between australia and new zealand and sadly he was killed, he entered New Zealand waters and uh, was swamped by a, a large wave and, and was killed. But um, his best friend said during the documentary, it's amazing, I know nobody can see kayak the Tasman, but as soon as you say, could you see kayak the Tasman, it sort of becomes possible, just by the act of saying it. And although you still know it's not possible, you start looking at maps and calculating loads and fuel loads and food loads and water pumps. And he said, and this thing which you kind of know is impossible becomes possible just by the act of attempting it. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a lot on that in terms of, um, you know, some of the things that uh, we've then tried. Um, you know you're you are trying to assess it you're trying to do it safely but you are still relying on other people's um judgment around that and i think that that is the other side of the coin because most of the things that i've managed to to do uh, in the sporting arena have usually relied on someone else um to be part of that so um in 1983 um, when we were raising money to go to the 1984 Winter Paralympics, you know, we, you know, we didn't receive any, mon uh, any funding as a team. This was back before the days of British sport being exactly, very well funded. Exactly, and, and lottery and everything mm. else. And, and again, you, you largely in those days, and, in, and comparatively still now, you had to be a successful athlete in order to attract the funding. Whereas we were, you know, a British team coming into winter sports, um, which, you know, w was a bit of a, a laugh, really, in many cases. And so we raised money to get the team to various competitions and then over to um, the 84 Games. But what we then decided to do was um, uh, three a, a challenge to raise money. So we did three... Um, Ra uh, marathons in three different sports in 30 days in order to raise money and the the thing at the end was that 
you had to guess the time that it would take to do all three combined in order to win 50, 50 pounds in those days. And you had to pay either, I don't know, 50 pence or a pound to enter the competition. And through that, we raised about 3,000 pounds and paid out 50 pound uh, prize. But what we did then was a canoe marathon, which was 42K in Norway. And that was obviously the safe one because we were all skiers. We then did um, something called the Devizes to Westminster Canoe Marathon, which is definitely the, the worst thing I've ever done in my sporting career. I, I didn't really do my homework, and um, I knew there was this canoe marathon, so I thought 42K, sitting down in a canoe, you know, piece of cake, you know. And it turned out to be uh, 200K, um, non-stop, um, and they, and they said there was these things called portages. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, you get the canoe, you put it over your head, and you run with it around the locks, and then put it back in the water and get back in. And I said, oh. <laughs> I said, how many of those? He said, 72 of those. <laughs> and what's the longest one? A mile and a quarter run with a canoe. And, and again, I had to have someone in the canoe with me as, as the uh, other guy, a uh, steerer. So, so he then had to be prepared to do that. And then 14 days after that, we then did the London Marathon, which, by which case, you know, at which stage I was almost um, unable to walk, let alone run 26 miles. But you had to finish the three to, um, to get the money. So we did it. Um, and... I remember getting out of the canoe at Westminster um, just as my guide uh, passed out and, and the strain of, you know, guiding me and being part of it for 27 hours nonstop was just a little bit too much for him. Um, but, you know, it was just, again, the elation of doing something as crazy as that, um, probably not quite as prepared as I should have been for that, um, was just something I will always, always have at the back of my mind that, that you've pushed your endurance and levels of comfort to, to the absolute limit and beyond. And that told me so much about myself as well as, as, well as obviously um, what, what the sport was about, but it was what I was about in terms of uh, going to that nth degree. And you got to those Olympics and... It was, six, it was six Olympics you went to? I went to, yeah, six Olympics, six Paralympics and three World Championships and two European. I mean, you had an extraordinarily successful career. It was, yeah, long uh, and <laughs> successful. I think my best uh, result was fourth in the relay in, in 92 in Arborville and we were then seventh in the individual um, biathlon, which was the ski shooting. Again, another amazing event where you, you have a, a gun um, in those days it was two two rifles with a, an optical sight on them and an oscillator and then you put your earphones on and as you pointed the gun to the center of the target the note in the oscillator then went up or down depending on where you were pointing the gun and then you had to shoot um, five five shots ski on shoot five shots ski on and then your combined time plus your ski time um uh you know was your final result and and again just having that sort of uh i don't know you know the the shooting bit was just you were very good at shooting so i made up for um my time a bit in in shooting well even if i didn't ski as good and uh, and after your olympic career and world championships you went into sports administration and management. Was this going back to what you said about you want to get other people redefining their own their own barriers? Yeah, I I, I think um, you know what well, they usually say, don't they? The, those that are too old to do and then manage. And I think that for me was part of it that I I, I just loved the, the sports opportunities, and my my day job was still in social work, so I, I, I've never formally worked in a sports administration it's always been as a as a volunteer and as a um you know a willing uh, body but you know then getting a chance to manage the first blind uh, cricket team in uh, india was was kind of challenge in terms of the issues that that threw up and then i managed athletics teams in uh, in uh, germany as well at world championships so you were then getting opportunities to 
um, uh, do a range of sports and and bring some of your um, skills learned through through experiencing and competing in sport into then managing it. So a bit of psychology uh, as well as then general administration. And then the day job being in, in social work, you're using quite a lot of, uh, of psychology and, and quite a lot of listening abilities and everything else in your day job, which then you could certainly pass over into, uh, into your sporting career and vice versa. So a lot of things I learned through my sports management, I could then bring into my, my day job as well. And what was it that you really enjoyed about the administration? Do you, is the camaraderie of sport a big part of it for you? Are you competitive? I think it, it's getting then the best for others. So you, you want the facilities. So my job, I thought, as an administrator or a manager was to almost preempt the issues that my, my skiers or my cricketers or my athletes were then going to face and actually try and deal with the issues in advance of that. And, of course, most of the people there were disability uh, disabled, so they had... A different range of issues so you're trying to sort out transport issues for people with a physical disability in a in a perhaps non um you know uh, accepting or easy environment or you're, you're dealing with um, a whole range of technical issues for various people in 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 various countries that then basically um, you wouldn't have the normal sort of reserves to fall back on so we were in um, Macau, for instance, and then you're trying to deal with uh, the Ch Chinese sort of mentality in terms of service provision and, uh, um, and in Japan in terms of the whole protocols around uh, status and stuff like that. So really good challenges, but it's things that you needed to do in order to, to get the best for, for your athletes. And is that process ongoing now? Where is the... British Paralympics set up and, and where is disabled sport right now in the UK do you think? Oh I think uh, I think it's it's progressed incredibly well when when I um, was chairman of uh, Paralympics uh, GB um, for eight years you know we had very little funding we were virtually bankrupt after each games um, we then had the spectre of 2012 so so being on the bid team for 2012 was again probably one of the highest points in my sporting uh, life really being you know out there as an equal uh, what you could contribute rather than as some sort of tokenism and so you know in those days the, the 2012 games were the first uh, summer games where the Olympics and the Paralympics had to be bid for together up till then they could have chosen not to have uh, the Paralympics in the bidding cities, whereas 2012 uh, were the first summer games where you didn't have a choice. And what was said to me very clearly was that the Paralympics um, wouldn't necessarily win the bid for London, but it could certainly lose it for London. So no pressure there then to, <laughs> to, to actually de de deliver um, a credible uh, presentation around the Paralympics uh, and and how we in Britain could could do it probably as good if not better than anyone else in the world, which it, I'm pleased to say is actually what happened in uh, 2012. Are still regarded, I think, as the as the as the paramount uh, Paralympic Games that there's there's been so far. So, what was your role within the bid process? You were in charge of the whole Paralympic side of the bid. No, I was in charge of everything um, in the same as the other bid members. So I was across everything, whether it be on venues, whether it be on um, PR, whether it be on... So it, it was not cut down to I did Paralympics and everyone else did the Olympics. It actually was a very joint process because the bidding was joint. So the, the issues were obviously, in, in many ways, we worked on the Paralympics and then backwards. So if all the stadium basically could, uh, could house the events for the Paralympics, then rather than retrofitting them, you could just move that back for the Olympics and that one made life uh, you know, very much more simple. And then you were doing everything from politics to people that didn't think we should have the games and the funding, the money and the sponsors and, and again linking into them uh, equally across the board and and in many ways I think they the Paralympics was quite a 
um, a feather, I think, in their bidding cap because um, I do think a number of the sponsors really took to the the Paralympic aspects of the of the bid um, almost more than they did for the Olympic part of it because it was something slightly removed from their their own comfort zone. But I think they could then see some some really good. Um, uh, advantages, I think, for for the companies, but also uh, for them, you know, for the whole ethos of sport in the UK. We'll get to the Olympics in just a second. I have to say, I do remember Britain and the British people just mobilising behind the Paralympic Games, like I, I never really thought possible. It was absolutely extraordinary. Um, but just going back to the bid process, how long? Was that process? Because the games were awarded in two thousand and five. Five. Yeah, we. I. I got. Um. I got asked to be on the on the bid team in two thousand and two. We then had the um, bidding process start at the end of two, beginning of three, and then. Um, the, That's the, not that long, actually. No, we were fairly late entering the um, entering the the list. I think there were nine candidate cities. Which they would then reduce to f uh, to f uh, five, and we then um, started the process rolling rolling at uh, uh, Canary Wharf. Um, got the people together um, on on the bid team, and then almost got the strategy. I mean, the 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 bid books about you know two and a half feet thick. I mean, it really is enormous in terms of what you had to do to convince the the um, assessing bidding committee what what the what the um, uh, process was and 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 give the guarantees that you could um, provide the the structure that was needed. What was that moment like in two thousand and five? I'm just I'm trying to think of the, the where it was done. The announcement was it Singapore? Singapore. I don't, um, know, I don't know why I remember that. Were you there for that? I was. Um, again, you know, uh, you 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 asked about you know whether it was just Paralympics. That what they were very clearly wanting to do was to say this was an inclusive bid process. So so the Paralympics weren't an add-on; they were an integral part of the whole process. And as such, I obviously was involved in presentations to the IOC on the Paralympics, but obviously um, part of the inclusion agenda. And then um, I, I think I was half expecting not to be asked to go to um, to Singapore, but no, they said this is for uh, the bid team and you're part of it and therefore you're going to be uh, over there and being part of the whole process. And uh and then in the room, as they gradually dropped out, you know, um, I think uh, Russia went out first and then we, we got mildly confident and then New York went out and we thought, yeah, we're, we're now the top three. I think the big favourites were Madrid and Paris and then the big shock came when Madrid dropped out and then it just left us and Paris. And when we went into the room on the final um, decision, um, there were about 150 journalists in front of the French and one in front of us. So we thought, well, they've obviously leaked the um, decision because they were expecting Paris and uh, to win it. Well, I mean, I remember that they had um, cameras in Trafalgar Square. Yep. yep. Uh, famous scenes. I remember watching it on TV when it was announced, but no one really thought Brit uh, London was going to get it. They were distinct second favourites. And 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 it was it was just uh, tingling. You're standing there, and we were having the well. You know, we've done a good fight, and you know, da da da. And then suddenly, when he said the the venue was going to be London, and everything went. I think I got a hit on the head by about five mobile phones because <laughs> as people jumped up in the air, their phones flew across the uh, you know the the room, and um, uh, it was just just unbelievable. Um, and and slightly numb, you know, that that you got this success, and then gradually starting to dawn just how, um, you know, what it meant and and what we still then had to do to to live up to what we had actually presented. And when it was all done and dusted, did you just think, this is as good as it gets, and, yeah. and I'm done? Yeah. And, and and meeting these legends of sport, you know, I am I, I'm I'm not particularly into 
sort of stardoms and stuff like that. But, you know, standing there chatting to Muhammad Ali and um, Kit Kano and uh, Bortsoff. And, and I just think, that, you know, and me, this guy from Hackney, um, <laughs> you know, blinded age 10 standing in this room with these legends of sport you know and, and that was p quite apart from the fact i'd just been doing a jig with bobby charlton and sven goran erickson and uh, <laughs> you know uh, colin jackson and uh, day uh, daily thompson all people there you know on first name terms with me and i just i just really did think i'd, I'd died and got to heaven really in a in a sporting context after you stopped your sports administration um, you've carried on doing sport. You've just got back from Norway. Still as passionate as ever. Well, very much so. And um, trying to get other people to, to have those experiences is still there. It's still, uh, there's still a battle because um, one, of the, one of the really powerful um, sort of things that we got from the 2012 Games, and I think I had realised, but not, not quite to the to level, the, the Paralympics we thought and hoped would challenge people's perceptions of disability, and I and I think the 2012 Games did that um, absolutely phenomenally. What we hadn't quite realised is the impact on people with disabilities themselves. And when I lost my sight 50 odd years ago, 90 um, odd percent of, of children with disabilities went to special schools, and then. Um, specialist colleges and then hopefully into employment. Nowadays, the majority of, of youngsters with disabilities go to mainstream schools with a very few going to special schools. And one of the results from the Paralympics was um, we, we were going to hold these sort of taster days to see whether we could get some youngsters interested in the different Paralympic sports. And we originally thought we'd get about 100, 150 turning up. And I think nearly 1,000 turned up for the first um, uh, games that we um, trialled. And what we hadn't quite realised was that the majority of kids then with disabilities in mainstream schools suddenly for the first time saw people like them doing these amazing things on the telly, you know, uh, one-legged high jumpers or wheelchair racing or blind long jumpers. And they said, hold on, I want a bit of that. Why, why can't I do that? Why, why has no one ever told me that these things exist? And most of us learned these stuff from, from you know, being in, in uh, specialist schools. So, you know, the sport was there, the football, the cricket, the athletics, the rowing. But for many of the youngsters in the, in the mainstream schools, they just didn't get the chances to do any sport. Uh, they stayed in the classroom during break time and they weren't able to stay on after school. Team games were largely ruled out. And suddenly um, that sort of really gave me another impetus post-2012 to say, well, there's dozens and hundreds of kids out there that, that could or should actually know, know about these sports and perhaps uh, get a chance to try them. So I'm still involved with uh, my, my sports club in London, Metro, uh, we do an athletics event in Mile End every year in June, and we get about 100 children coming along to the athletics events. Um, we do other activities throughout the year in different sports, sailing and stuff like that. And, and the numbers now are growing and growing in terms of saying, actually, we didn't know you could do this. Um, can we have a go? And that, and that still is the, a challenge, getting more and more and more people to, to have the sorts of things and the chances that I've had. But this is obviously an extraordinary cause. It's something we want to support. If kids want to find out more, where can they do that? The, um, the, the, um, the general thing, obviously, is the Paralympic site. There's, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of um, um, uh, links on there in terms of the different sports and the different disability groups. Um, my, my sports club, Metro, have got their um, website, metroblindsport.org.uk. Um, 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 and obviously, uh, they they would certainly link into people with a, uh, a sight loss issue, um, and and try and link them in uh, to a sport that they might be interested in. Okay, I know you're a busy man. You have another speaking engagement this evening. I'm close to wrapping things up. I have a couple more questions. Of this, one thing that really stands out sitting here talking to you is your extraordinary. Uh, 
positivity almost sounds a bit cliche, doesn't it? But practicality and um, just determination to get the maximum out of life. How do you maintain that mindset? Because everybody, I think everybody deep down knows that what they're thinking are big problems aren't really big problems. But I think everyone's guilty at times of of losing a bit of perspective. And it seems like you just stay endlessly positive. I think I think the fact that I've, I've been blind nearly five, six times longer than I could see. So for me now, it's not a question of adapting or changing or or the challenges are, aren't, aren't the... Uh, the ones that I faced when I was ten, you know, I, I, for me, being um, without sight is is normal or is is the day to day experience, and therefore the next thing you want to do in life um, is the next thing you, you're you're ready to do. So for me, it's that that whole challenge bit of it again, um, whether it be you know um, writing a, a book which which you know recently had published or whether I'm um, thinking of doing some creative writing or, you know, it's just anything like that that, that suddenly crops up and you think, actually, yeah, I don't mind having a go at that or, you know, um, trying something uh, completely different um, would, would, you know, is, is just on the agenda and it just keeps me going. I, I do get bored easily. I mean, when I retired, I, I probably packed up work a couple of years too early and and really suddenly you know woke up and thought well, I haven't got anything to do today um, and so for the last few years I've been desperately trying to ensure that I wake up every day and I've got more than one or two things to do um, and, 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 and meet those challenges really. I suppose it's just a case of viewing your life for everybody as, as circumstances there are some things you'd like to change and there are some things that are great about your life and everyone works within that framework and you just try and get the most out of it you right. can and, and do yeah. as much as you can. Yeah, no, that very much that is. And, and you know, as you learn more about yourself, you then want to either ch challenge or change some of those aspects of, your, uh, of yourself in terms of um, ability or inability um, and, and seeing whether you can re redress the balances there. Okay, well, as I say, I know you've got a speaking engagement, but just quickly, I, I'm never a fan of podcasts where they always ask the same question at the end, but it does seem that I've got in the habit of asking people if they have a singular piece of advice or a life philosophy that they feel anyone listening would benefit from hearing. I, I don't know about a philosophy, but I, 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 I always... Um... I always usually end my speeches with a statement about a disability being a state of mind. It's my state and other people's minds. You can't change my state, but hopefully I might be able to change your minds. Mark, that is fabulous. Thank you so much for your time and inviting me into your home. And uh, we will let you grab a bite to eat and go to your speaking engagement. And thank you to Izzy the dog for remaining so quiet-ish. <laughs> Great pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. To find out more about Mike, check out his website, www.mikebrace.co.uk. Mike also has a book out telling his extraordinary story. It's called Don't Ask Me, Ask the Dog, and it's available at good bookstores everywhere and on Amazon. We'll be back next Sunday, so speak to you then. In the meantime, like, share and comment. Thank you for listening.